Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 102 of the Hardly Millennial Podcast, where we are young, dumb, and full of opinions. Opinions, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it's just a small group with you today. Today, it is just I, Adam Hansen. And I, Kyle Rose. That's right, motherfuckers. Kyle Rose. How are you, Kyle? I'm doing good. This is a, it's a bit more intimate it's than, a it more has, intimate. than it I, has been lately. I am house-sitting for my parents, and I forgot that a uh, a podcast would have to take place this <laughs> week. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I got to, I did forget that I was house-sitting when I got here, ready to house-sit, and then or right before I left the house-sit, I was like, Oh fuck! I'm gonna be here through the weekend. <laughs> I have to like bring my shit with me in a podcast. I just yes, totally, you do. Just totally fucking forgot about it. So here we are. Um, so if it's a little echoey, that's why there's no foam in this room. None at all. Just furniture and a, a exercise bike, or is that a stair climber? It's one it, of those things. It might be a stair climber. It's but one of it's, those things. It's, an, it's important to have. So, anyways, hello guys. Here we are today. Yes. Just for you. We're Just, all here. For you. Just for you. So Kyle brought this up to me before we... Uh, oh my God, this chair's so fucking loud. Yeah. So Kyle brought this up to me before we started the podcast. And that was that today marks a two-year anniversary. Indeed. Of something that is very near and dear to Kyle and I. Yes. And Kyle and I have a mutual appreciation and liking of a band called Linkin Park. Yes, we do. I would dare to say it's our favorite band. Quite possibly. And two years ago today, the lead singer unfortunately took his own life. Indeed. And Kyle and I were actually ready to go. We had tickets to go see him. Yeah, I believe it was just the following month. Yeah, we had tickets to go see him in August. Yes, and it, was, it was very sad. Two years ago today, he killed himself, and we were no longer able to see him. That is the first time, that is the first time I ever cried over a celebrity death. Yep. First time. And it was weird, because beforehand... Like when when celebrities died and people were like crying over it, like Robin Williams was a big one that people cried over. David Bowie was another one people cried Mm -hmm. over. I was always just like, look, like I get it. Like I loved Robin Williams. I like David Bowie. But it was, I was always just like, but crying over a celebrity, that part didn't really make sense to me. And then Chester Bennington died. Yes. And I fuck, I don't know what happened, dude. I just fucking bawled yep. about it. I was so fucking distraught over that death. And ever since then, like, I, like I can't ever give people shit about crying no, you know, when a celebrity no. dies now. Yeah, and I, I remember at the time being at work, and I got a message from you. Mm-hmm. And you had told me the news that it had actually happened Mm -hmm. i was just like no fucking way man and i immediately had to google it and just articles everywhere of you know chester gone at this time they're looking into and everything trying to get official reports to make sure everything was fine but basically it came up as a suicide yeah well and it was my uh it was my oh you're good kyle i'm adjusting kyle's microphone right now because it, i baby. fucking suck at sound <laughs> um so so i actually got a call from thomas my brother thomas at the time and i remember i was here i was visiting at home i can't remember if i was living here at the time with my parents for whatever reason i might have been in like limbo from like moving into Maybe. the house yeah. in maricopa but I mean, I don't live there. <laughs> but anyways, I was uh, and I was sitting on the couch and all of a sudden I got a call from Thomas and Thomas was and he wasn't crying or anything, but he was like, like, Adam, guess who died today? And I was like, you know, and I, I think I said some random guesses or whatnot. Yeah. He was like, no, dude, Chester. I was like, Chester, because I... Lincoln Park was the farthest thing oh, away yeah. from my mind when right. he told me this. And he was like, like, Chester from Lincoln Park. And I was like, what? 
No fucking way. Yeah, I was I was dumbfounded. I was yeah. like, no, 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 no. There's no way. And I fucking looked it up. And yeah, dude, he fucking died. And I just remember like almost being in shock about it. Like, what the fuck? Like, what? Especially finding out he killed himself. Yeah, especially finding out it was a suicide. Because it's, it's one thing if all of a sudden like you read like, oh, he was in a car, yeah. a bad yeah, car accident a bad car. or something. Yeah. But no, it was like he killed himself. And I remember like I went to the bathroom and still just in shock. And then I came out from the bathroom and, you know, my mom was like looking up stuff about it and things because she knows that it was my favorite band. Right. And I remember her just asking me, like, how are you doing? And, dude, I just lost Waterworks. it. And I even remember, like, as I, like, lost it and, like, started to cry, like, I was literally telling her, like, I don't know why this is, like, affecting me this much. Right. But, like, I am, like, seriously, like, in a bad place right now because of this. I was so sad, dude. Mm -hmm. It was fucking horrible. No, yeah, I I remember that day because it's like, yeah, you had reached out to me to let me know. And I was like, holy crap, because looked it up and confirmed that it had happened. And I was just like, wow. So immediately, my first thought was, you know, we got to get together. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I'm off work, we got to get together. We got to grab a couple of beers. We got to <laughs> pour one out for him yeah. and just celebrate his life. Yeah. Know? That's what we did. Yeah, we we got we met up and we like just, uh, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this chair and it's like halfway broken. And it just loves to fucking make this loud ass cracking noise with every. I just have to stay as still Damn. as I possibly yeah. can. Don't move. Don't <laughs> fucking move. <laughs> but yeah, we hung out. I remember we just like ended up hanging out for like four or five hours just talking yeah. about different Lincoln Park shit. And one thing that even got me afterwards, and I still haven't seen this video till this day. Was they ended up doing like a benefit concert? Oh for yeah, him, right. You know, yeah, had a bunch of big name people and everything who came to you know play with Lincoln Park and stuff, yeah. and the money went to the family and things. Yeah, really, like, he left behind six kids, guys. The guy yeah, had six that children. Was pretty ridiculous. And it's like I did. I felt a little upset at the ticket prices because it's like I would have really liked to have attended. Uh, yeah, I I know I was too. I actually remember I even like wrote a comment on one of the like event pages about it, and I was like, "This is fine." Like. Like, how is anybody who, like, actually, like, really liked Linkin Park supposed to make... Like, I would have loved to go to this. Yeah. But, I mean, tickets were just outrageous. And I and I get it. I get that a great portion of the funds went to the family and shit. I totally get that. And, of course, I mean, you can kind of tell that because it was a benefit concert, that really who they were advertising to were the people that they've worked with or know... That are yes, famous. Yes, exactly. You know, so don't get me wrong. I get all of that. In retrospect, I get all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that being a, a beside the point, I remember they, I think they had it going on YouTube live. Yeah. So you could watch on YouTube live. And I started watching like the first five minutes and I literally like, I was getting so emotional. Yeah. Just watch, because here's how it opened up, you guys. So, first of all, for anybody who's not familiar with the band Linkin Park, they've done songs, they've done hit songs like In the End, you know, In the Numb. End, Doesn't Even Matter, Numb, Faint, Faint, they did uh, all, for the first three Transformer movies, they did the yeah. the main theme song for yep, it. they sure did. Um so a pretty big band for our huge, generation. Yeah, huge you know? for always they always had at kids. least one or two hits on every album that came out that was playing at on least, the radio. Yeah. The most recent one being Heavy. You know, why is yeah. everything so heavy? And I well, mean you're gonna get copyright struck. <laughs> <laughs> only only ten seconds. That's true. <laughs> and they uh but I remember the way that the concert opened up was they literally just had a microphone in the middle of the stage and there was a spotlight over the microphone and then they just started playing the song numb yeah. right but yeah. there was and nobody so was singing again yet. again so uh, for anybody who doesn't know chester bennington is the lead singer of lincoln park oh yeah good good distinction yeah good distinction because it's like oh well if he's the guitarist why'd they have the microphone <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah they had the microphone up there and it was just a spotlight over the microphone you couldn't see any of the air stage you couldn't see any of the other bandmates and the audience just started singing to yeah. the song numb Every while lyric. This, and 
I got like 30 seconds through it, dude. And I just, I even think about it now, I still get a little emotional. Yeah, no, about yeah. It. I, I welled up when I first, you know, when and I, first I was saw just it. like, I can't do this. This is going to be a fucking emotional roller coaster. It is. It is going to be a, just hugely emotional. Yeah. But yeah, like it was that moment really that I realized, like, like not only what a big fan of the band Linkin Park I was, mm-hmm. but just like what an impact they must have had on my life personally. Oh, absolutely. If, if a death of one of the members could affect me that way. Yep. It was uh, it was so sad. But it yeah, was. And I didn't even know today was the two year anniversary until yep. you had said something yeah. when we came I, over I here. Saw it on social media before I came over. <laughs> so Yeah, it was it was it was definitely a big thing. It's like especially to know that, you know, Chester actually, you know, came from Arizona. Yeah, that's right. He's a native. Yeah, he's a a native. native. I remember when I went to go see him in uh, one of his concerts, they uh, even said like during one of like in the intermission of one of the songs when I was like, oh, good to be home, you know. And what's crazy, though, is like, uh, especially for like you and I, it's like he he's not just from Arizona. He's not from like Prescott or no. Flagstaff or Tucson. Like he's from the Valley, valley. where yeah. we live. Yeah. Like the high school that he went to was in our high school's district. Yeah. You know, I think he went to Mountain View or something. Something you like know? that. Like our football t- teams played against each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, yeah, it, it was definitely a big thing. So it's like, you know, there's somebody that went to school here that went to school with Chester. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, every, anybody who's lived here has met somebody who yeah. went to school with him. You know, because exactly. I think because I think he graduated maybe a few years before we started high school. Right. Yeah. So like when we were in elementary school, he was going through junior high and high school right oh, yeah, here yeah. in the valley. You yeah, know? because what like even like the videos for in the end initially were he and all the other bandmates are like. 18, 19. Yeah. And I think the young. other band members are from like California. Yeah. The other band the members are coming, which is also, which is also kind of why I was a little eh about the concert because the concert took place in California where all they came from. That's and a good, that's a good point. I never considered that, but instead you're right. of having the concert in his hometown. Yeah, that's, you're right. That's a good point. Again, I understand. I understand, you know, bandmates, you know, they've been the closest to him. You know, they they make the choices. And, of course, that's where you're going to have most of his friends. Right. Because, yeah, you know, he might have been born in Arizona, but he's been living in California for the majority of his life. I was going to say, yeah, I think think by the... uh, by the time he died, like, I think he'd lived in California California longer than he lived For a long time, yeah. yeah. But, no, but but you're right, though. I, I, I never, like made that like connection but yeah it's why wouldn't you have in his you know, hometown the, yeah in his hometown yeah who knows yep but you know do do what you want i guess exactly but um but yeah you know so uh that's sad yep. uh so glad we got to start out the podcast that way. <laughs> now let's move into let's move into something maybe a little let's more like cheery a little, um <laughs> um so comic-con Oh yes, San, San Diego, Diego Comic Con. Before you came over, I was like, I was on one of those like Facebook video holes, and I got caught up with presumably what was like all the trailers so far that was ah. released at Comic Con. So I saw the trailer for The Witcher, oh, which yeah. I'm not familiar with those games. Uh, I, but... I played a little bit of it, but again, not really sure about it. Because aren't they also having a isn't it Cavill that's playing? Henry Cavill plays yeah. like the main so guy in it. From Superman to yeah. Geralt, I think, is the main character. Some name. shit like that. Yeah. But so I saw that trailer. They're making a Watchmen show on HBO, yep. which confused the fuck out of me when I watched the trailer. Because, <laughs> but well, okay, to be fair, like, I'm not familiar with the Watchmen comics. No, you know? no My, I'm not either. The closest relation I have with it was the Zack Snyder movie that yep. was released years ago. And the Zack Snyder movie had, you know, like five, six main superhero characters that have followed. And presumably, or allegedly, again, I never confirmed this, but allegedly the, that movie followed the comics pretty closely. Sure. And, and like, you know, you saw Dr. Manhattan in there, yep. you know, the, the fucking ink block. Blot face uh, guy Rorschach, yeah, and the owl, you know, all these other characters yeah. that were in there, the comedian. And I'm watching this trailer for 
Watchmen, and I just can't fucking tell like what's going on. Yeah, I I right. feel like I I think the show is supposed to take place after the events of the movie or the comics. I don't know. Maybe. But needless to say, I watched it and I was just like. Okay, well, maybe this will be good, I guess. Because sure. I really have zero clue what the fuck is happening. Yep, no idea. Know? I got no clue. They couldn't even, like, they couldn't even, when you watch a trailer, even if you don't give a lot away in a trailer, they're still like, here's the general gist of what's going on. Right. And all the general gist I got was like, oh, so, like, the police are, like, turning on the people by wearing masks so that you can't tell them apart from the superhero people? I don't, I don't fucking know. <laughs> if you know, leave a comment. Comment down Explain below. it to me. But, so that trailer got released. Uh, another trailer I saw that was interesting, and... I found this especially interesting because apparently this book series is much more popular than I thought it was. Did you ever see the movie or heard of the movie The Golden Compass that came out when we were in like maybe junior high or like early high school days? Uh, that sounds familiar. Nicole Kidman was in it. The big thing was like there was a polar bear that wore like a fucking helmet and armor. And shit like yeah, that. That was always on like the covers of the movie and familiar. shit. So I saw that movie. Oh, okay. Right? And I was very whatever about it. I was sure. like, this movie's fucking everywhere. You know? Now, the concept was kind of cool, I thought. But I just had zero clue what the fuck was going on. Sure, But sure. I have friends. I had friends at the time who had watched that movie. And they were really into the book. So they were super excited that that was getting released. And... Watched the trailer for this because they're making it to a show now. Oh, and okay. actually, the the girl who played uh, Wolverine's daughter in Logan Ooh. is the main girl in it. Interesting. Yeah, so it was really interesting to see her because she speaks with a British accent in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. F- so <laughs> for those, so Kyle just did this like weird shake of the head thing when yeah, I said like that. Yeah, like a double take. Yeah. <laughs> so I that was odd to see that is odd because not only does. Actually, I don't even know. Does she... I know she's, like, Mexican in real life. Right. At least I think she's Mexican or Spanish in real life. Like, obviously spoke Spanish fluently. But, like, I don't know if she actually had, like, an accent in real life, though. I don't know. <laughs> Again. But Logan was fantastic. Logan was fantastic. But so they're making a show of that, which looks intriguing, maybe, because it's a show it'll explain more. But maybe. when I, But when I saw the trailer for it, I was just like... I have never heard of anybody reading these fucking books. Yeah, and it's not something that's highly talked about. Yeah, it's when the Hunger Games came out, everyone and their mother was reading the Hunger Games. Fuck, everyone and their grandmother has read Harry Potter at this point or oh, seen the yeah. movies or there's some, you know, some kind of fandom involved well, yeah, with it. Yeah, especially with the Fantastic Beasts going off into its own yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, Twilight was, oh, yeah. was, was even around that long before they fucking, nope. you know, milked the shit out of that franchise oh, yes they did and then so all of a sudden it's like golden compass and i'm not gonna lie i saw the trailer i was like maybe this is a book series i have to like look into and maybe. figure out the fuck it might be on. the next big thing for all you know adam it might be it might be yeah see I, I i think you get to a point where you can really tell hype is overcome the series especially like with book series and everything when you have the actors from the movie or the show on the book cover when they re-release it yeah you know you're right because actually when i think about it i don't think they ever did that with harry potter i don't think they did because they already had the good book covers i was gonna say but i saw it with twilight i saw it with hunger games Mm -hmm. so it's just like no they re-released it it's like oh here are the characters you know from the movie how about you read the book where it came from just like, no, people knew about Harry Potter before the movies came out. Yeah, I even think I remember seeing that when the movie Golden Compass came out. Seeing like, right. the, the movie poster on like the book thing. You know, Because obviously it was like the number one bestseller now in bar- all the fucking Barnes and Nobles sure. and shit at the time. But like, but yeah, there's just... I mean, needless to say, the point I'm getting at here is there, I haven't seen anything from Comic-Con that I'm like... Excited. Head over heels about yet. Yeah, I'm not sure because it's like, yeah, it sounds like a lot of TV shows. It's like, where's our movies? Yeah. Where's our, you know, But I mean, stuff? I guess we are early into it. How long yeah. is Comic-Con? Um, isn't it a week? I don't know if it's a week. Maybe it's a 
three or four days. So I don't know, like, hardly anything when it comes to Comic-Con. <laughs> I just go, oh, hey, new trailer! <laughs> well, but, like, that's my point, though. Like, I feel like in the past Comic-Cons, like, I remember when they released the trailer for, like, Suicide Squad yep. or Endgame, you know, yep. when that first So, yeah, was it released. should be exciting because I think Marvel will probably be giving out their plan for Phase 2 of the Cinematic Universe. Well, yeah. Not phase two of the Avengers. I was, was going to say, yeah. But. but whatever the next saga is of the MCU. And then maybe we'll get another Joker trailer. That would be cool. That would be fun. Ooh, speaking of Joker, I, I don't think I've talked to you about this yet. How do you... Or maybe we did talk about it. I don't remember. Did we talk about Robert Pattinson being the new Batman? Oh, we did in episode 100. Oh, we did talk about that. Yeah. I can't remember. What was our thoughts about that? Um, I think the basic idea was we'll, we'll wait and see. <laughs> we'll wait and see what the fuck happens. Yeah, because at this point, just to down Robert Pattinson for his work in Twilight seems like kind of a messed up way to go about it. It's yeah. just like, it, same thing for like downing uh, what Hayden Christensen just because he got a really shitty part as Anakin. Yeah, but I still doubt that actor. I don't know. I haven't really seen him in anything since because I think his point. career got killed. <laughs> no, I, okay, but here's the thing. I don't think his career got killed because of Star Wars. Are you saying he didn't have one to begin with? No, I'm saying he had the potential. Like, And then Anakin flushed it down the drain. No, no, what I'm saying is I don't think – people. everybody sits here and says like, oh, he was given a shit role as Anakin Skywalker, right? And that's why his career is down the toilet or whatnot. I just think he's a shitty fucking actor, and I think George Lucas is a shitty fucking director. Yeah, so yeah, you have it in pairs, but I do think the sand with how coarse it is is not good lines, not good writing for dialogue. <laughs> no, well, that was look when I enjoyed the prequels of the Star Wars movies that came out. You know, mm. I did, I really did. Maybe not Clone Wars, but I That's enjoyed... That's basically the typical <laughs> response. But I enjoyed Phantom Menace, and I enjoyed mm-hmm. Revenge of the Sith. It, they have but their moments. They have their moments, you're right. But George Lucas can just not direct. He's just not a director. It's just mm-hmm. not his thing. Like, if you look... Like, look, the only reason A New Hope did well was because it was completely 100% irrevocably original. Yes. Okay. Nobody did anything like that. That is why that movie just shot, a, sh- you know, shot George Lucas into stardom. But guess what? He did not direct The Empire Strikes Back. He did not direct Return of the Jedi. Hmm. Those were two separate directors. They're they're literally nobodies. Nobody knows who their names, unless you're a diehard, I'm sure. But right, like, right. But otherwise, like if you look at their like IMDb and shit, they didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. They didn't do any other big films. And, but then George Lucas comes in and does the first, second, and third one. He just, he's just not good. He doesn't pick the best actors. No. You know, I mean, and going back to Hayden Christensen, I saw him in movies outside of Star Wars. Yeah. He would, the first big one he did was with Samuel L. Jackson called Jumper, where he played a boy. That's right. He was. And you talked because Jumper. No, Jumper's not one of your favorite, right? No, no, no. You're thinking of Push. Yeah, see? Yeah. There we are getting those confused again. Yeah. Good job, Kyle. <laughs> Jumper, though, was... Uh, he, he just didn't do well in it. No, he didn't. It wasn't even that it was a bad movie. It was interesting, you know? I mean, it was a B movie for the, yeah, for for the sure. most part. But, like, he just does, he's just not a good actor. Mm-hmm. And then I saw him in another movie that was like an independent flip, flick with... Uh, there was one other big actor in there, John John Leguizamo. Is that how you pronounce his name? I think so. But he, you know who I'm talking about, yeah. though, right? So he did a movie with him that was like a, a post-apocalyptic kind of movie. Just sucked in that also. He's just not a good fucking actor. That's why his career's down the toilet, because he okay. just couldn't act to begin with. Right. And if after Star Wars you don't get a breakout role, then you're not going anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, no, that, that does make sense. And uh, actually, you know what? Something else I watched recently, too. I finally got around to watching it. 
because uh, I know last time I was on this podcast, we were talking about Tarantino. Yes. And I finally got around to watching uh, Hateful Eight. Okay, so that's a good one to bring up because I just got around to watching that too. Yeah. But let me ask you though, did you watch the just the movie version or did you watch the six part Version. The sixth part. Version. Okay, that's the version I watched also. Yes, because that's the one that was on Netflix. Yes. Okay, well, they have the movie version on Netflix also. Oh, yeah, that's right. I just But picked, the six I... part ones with all the, like, new scenes in there or whatnot. Or sure, what sure. Have you. What did you think of it? I liked it. I liked the... Uh, well, I, I don't know what that term is for everybody being inside... Like the whole film, like basically happening, uh, happening in one room, you know, in one room. Yeah. Um, I I think there is a name for it. Probably, I don't know what it's called know. though. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So I like the fact that it was very contained. I liked the very old western feel to it. You know, especially coming from what a couple <laughs> months ago playing Red Dead Redemption Two and everything, having that western kick. Yeah. So it's just like yes, it it really filled that western vibe for me that I liked. You know, of course you. You have your typical, you know, Tarantino actors, Samuel L. Jackson, and, uh, oh, what's uh, the other one that you see in quite a few of his films? Because he was the... Oh, oh, Eli Roth? Eli Roth, his... yes. Wait, no. I think no? that's incorrect. Is that incorrect? I, there is an Eli Roth, but he's right. a director. You're right. And he was in a Tarantino film, mm-hmm. but... The last name's Roth for sure. He was he was in Lie to Me. He was the yes, actor from yes, Lie to the, Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The main the main yeah. actor from Lie to Me. So we're just gonna do a quick uh, Google <laughs> a quick search. little Google here, and we're gonna find that out because that's gonna bother me to not know the main character's name. Tim. Tim Roth. Tim Roth. Okay, yeah. Great actor. I think he does good in Tarantino's films. What other? Uh, he was in... Oh, I, okay. I guess he's been in a few of them. Cause he's he been was in a few. In, he was in Reservoir Dogs, Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Fi- yep, Pulp and Fiction. then Hateful Eight. I think and those Hateful. are the only three, though. Yeah, yeah. So he, but, he's he's done Tarantino films yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he's pretty good. He's pretty good when it comes to doing Tarantino-type films. So I think I would have enjoyed this Odyssey, I guess you can call it. It kind of was. More if I had watched the movie version. Okay, because I can understand I, that. There were literally points in the six-part version that I watched yeah. where I was like falling asleep. Really? Because I just felt like, look, one thing I love about Tarantino, and obviously what makes Tarantino Tarantino, is his fucking dialogue. dialogue. Yes, it's absolutely. Great. He can have two people sitting next to each other for two hours, and you will be into that oh, conversation. Uh, you will be for enamored. And that's why I did enjoy the fact that it took place in one room because that's all it oh, was. Oh, that's, that's Tarantino's gimmick. It was, yeah, it was just conversation. conversation. Oh, it was good conversation. Yeah. But there were points in there where it was like, it just felt like it was dragging. Like, okay, we get it. We get it. Yeah, and, and of course, and I, I agree with you calling it an odyssey because... Every time you were like kind of brought into a new part, it kind of changed the way it was being done. It changed the dynamic. It changed like the feeling of the room. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Like the the big one that I feel is like a big spoilers. Change. Yeah. Here for <laughs> spoilers in case you haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, but the one part with the poison. Where it immediately changes. All of a sudden, now you have narration. Yes. Okay, so that's a good point right there, right? So you're right. When the poison and stuff got implemented, and now they're trying to figure out who poisoned who or whatnot, Mm -hmm. I could be remembering this wrong, but I think when you watch the six-parter thing, that didn't happen until, like, part four. Yeah, no, it was late. right? It was late, yeah. So, and you have to remember, every part was, like, an hour or close to an hour, Every every part of the six part yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you had to watch three fucking hours of character development, a fluff, you mm-hmm. know, that they obviously felt like they had to take out for the movie version because it was fluff. It was filler. Yeah. You know, it was it was Tarantino just going ham and then being like, all right, bro, we can't put all of that in there. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, by episode four, shit's starting to happen. I'm like, oh, okay. so wait, wait. So the six part thing, how long was that? It was pretty fucking long. 
I I don't think every episode was an hour, hmm. but I think it was maybe on the I longer did side. watch the movie because the movie, the movie part the movie is cut in into parts too. Well, it's not strictly like oh here's a part next episode. It goes like chapter part. one, chapter two. Yes, chapter... it does still okay. say chapter one through like six in the movie. Okay, so. The six-parter one does that also, but it's basically the movie with deleted scenes put in. Oh, okay. So every part is a different, like, quote-unquote episode. Okay, well then, yeah, because you said parts, and I'm like, well, the thing I watched... No, no, so if you go on to Netflix, there, you can watch the movie Hateful Eight, which is like two and a half hours long. Yeah, that's what I watched. Or you can watch <laughs> the six miniseries... Uh, Epi- the six episode miniseries Hateful Eight, which is like three plus hours long. Okay. Or a little longer than that, I would. So argue. then, yes. So then we would be talking about different things. I just assumed when okay. you said parts, I was like, well, yeah, it broke the thing into chapters, and you're no, like, oh, no, everything's was... like an hour, and it's like a six hour talk. I'm like, no, no, they no, literally I put two in, and a half they hours. They literally went movie. back and put in like deleted scenes and made it into like uh, a mini series okay. on. Well, Netflix. then, yeah, no, I completely understand why you would get tired. Yeah, because no, the movie totally comprised was beautiful. Because so, because when I was watching the six parter one, the first thing that was kind of coming to my mind when I was getting into it was like. This is not Tarantino's best work. That was my first initial thought of well, just. Now you, now you kind of see why a lot of those hit the uh, cutting the cutting floor or whatever. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because the entire time I was just first of all I did not like that it was a western again. Uh, one thing I enjoy about Tarantino, well, Django Unchained was his one before that. Oh, you're absolutely you know? right. And okay, to be fair, Django Unchained wasn't exactly a western per Mm -hmm. se right but basically it was a western well yeah you you had people in cowboy yeah he went to talking with the southern accent and yeah there was exactly i mean yes i know it was more heavily focused on the slavery aspect right it wasn't the old west it wasn't the old west like this hateful eight took place in the old Old west West. like i mean i think they samuel jackson kept talking about abraham lincoln remember yeah because his lincoln letter yeah his lincoln letter Oh, uh, um, yeah. And see, that's why I was just like, yes, comprised into a movie, comprised into two and a half hours. It was a great movie. I had a great time with that movie. Because, again, yes, being trapped in one room, letting uh, Tarantino go crazy with his dialogue. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Loved it. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like, yeah, watching the characters develop. And it just feels like, yes, this is what would happen in the West. Mm-hmm. You know? And just hearing the backstory. And it's like, I love that Tarantino does that, that nobody ever explains themselves. There's always like another character that explains, oh, this is who this is. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> I have figured out what you're up to. Uh-huh. Here's how I know. It's like, oh, don't you know? This guy's the hangman. Yeah. You know why they call him the hangman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Did you, uh, ooh, um, I was going to ask one question, but I'm going to ask a different question first. Oh, okay, are you, okay. Are you excited for the new Tarantino movie? Yeah, the Once Upon Hollywood? a Time in Hollywood? Yeah, I'm excited for the Manson and Manson everything. shit, Ooh. dude. So one thing I think is really cool about um, Tarantino is even when he's making a film about somebody, mm-hmm. a real person in right. life, in this case it's Charles Manson. Right. You never, you still don't know what you're going to get. Okay, that is absolutely a good point because I thought I knew what I was getting when I went into Inglorious Bastards. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. <laughs> and by the end of Inglorious Bastards, I was like, "Oh, he's taking liberties." Yes, <laughs> threw me for a fucking loop. Yes, threw me for a loop. That was because that was my the same thought process when I saw Inglorious Bastards. In fact, it was almost to a point to where so Inglorious Bastards is my favorite Tarantino film by far. Okay, and I think uh, because I watched it young, I think I still have a place in my heart for Kill Bill. So. Actually, I'll be honest. I have never seen Kill Bill 1 or 2. I saw both of them. And again, younger Kyle had this super fascination with samurais and katanas and everything. So as soon as, oh, Hattori Hanzo and everything, like, oh, he makes his own. Or I don't even know if that was the guy who uh, blacksmithed the best katanas ever. Right. But yeah, she gets that katana, you know, Uma Thurman's character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just goes fucking crazy. I'm like, yep. 
This is a great movie. So is is Kill Bill based off of a manga, or is that? I think is, so. Is that his own? Because creation? they're. Um, I, I'd have to look it up, but I know there is a because there's an animated part in the movie. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, it's I, I very. Do, I have seen bits and parts of the first one, but I've yes. never watched it from like beginning to end. I really liked it. Uh, the second one was okay. I mean, it it cleaned up the story, but it it was no volume one. I see. So it's just like, yeah, it, it cleared up the story and it had its moments. Again, saw both of them kind of young, like in my teens. And right. probably when I shouldn't have been watching it. But hey, you know, whatever. 13-year-old can watch, you know, limbs getting cut off and blood spurting everywhere. Right. <laughs> have well, a great time. And still appreciate the way they shot the scenes and everything. Because again, yeah. very Tarantino, very Odyssey driven. It's just like, oh, this scene is going to be, you know anime inspired oh this scene's gonna be all in black and white oh this yeah, scene's gonna be like, yeah so it's just like yeah they they definitely go around with it see i think see i think my problem with tarantino was because i was younger when i started watching his movies because when i first saw i think the first film i saw of his was like a lot of people pulp fiction yeah and when i first saw pulp fiction i was younger i was into film but i was really into like the computer animation shit in film uh. at the time right? Right? Okay. So I really liked watching like the Pixar movies and stuff at the oh, time yeah. because I was really into it. And when I finally watched Pulp Fiction, I was confused, I guess, as to why it was such the popular movie that it was. I think I kind of had the same experience because my first time with Pulp Fiction, mm-hmm. I couldn't finish it. Oh no! I think I was the same. I think I was on TV yeah. or something. I just like hardly well, paid attention to it. Well, that's also probably a bad reason. And... Oh, touche, touche. But I mean, like, even when I saw it, yeah, no, I think when I watched it on like DVD or whatever, I think I was like maybe fifteen or sixteen, something around that range. I was just like, eh, I don't really get the big deal. It's like people like clamor that this is you know a legendary film that'll go down, you know, and become this amazing classic like you know Citizen yeah. Kane or something. So I'm just like, I'm like, I don't really understand. It's like, it's like, again, it's like, I, I think to this day, I don't think I've seen the entirety of it, but it's like, I have a better understanding of it now because of Tarantino. I know what to expect. Yeah. Well, that's what, so Inglorious Bastards did that for me mm-hmm. because after seeing Pulp Fiction when I was younger, I never really had an interest in Tarantino. I was like, whatever. I think after that, somebody showed me Reservoir Dogs and I did enjoy Reservoir yeah. Dogs, but it yeah, because was... again, wasn't Reservoir Dogs is another one where it's like they're all kind of in one area. Yes, and, a and that lot was of his first film. That was his first yeah. film. Yeah, and so I did appreciate Reservoir Dogs. I think that was when I was first starting to get into like film school, and so I started to have a little more appreciation, especially for, it. for all of its nuance. Yeah, exactly. But then a friend I was going to film school with at the time, who was always my cinematographer on all my projects. He was the one who told me, dude, you have to watch Inglorious Bastards. And he told me, come over to my place on this day, and we're going to watch Inglorious Bastards. So I went over to his house. We got stoned off our ass. Oh, yeah. And I sat down and was watching this film with him. And that first fucking scene with the Jew hunter mm. and the French guy. Oh, it's so good. Dude, I was... I was literally so perplexed at how I could be so enticed into a scene, so captivated by a like scene. He builds of the world around you. Of yeah, but so captivated by a scene where it was literally one person sitting at one side of a table, the other person sitting right next to them, and they're just having a conversation for yeah. ten fucking minutes i don't and I remember, know how he does it but he does and it. i remember just sitting there with my eyes go- i must not have blinked <laughs> yeah the entire time yeah and after it ended like that scene ended and the, the rest of the film carried on i remember i was just like what the fuck <laughs> like what <sighs> the fuck tarantino jeez yeah being high Jesus probably helps Christ. too <laughs> well of course yeah but <laughs> I was just so, like, I was like, what the fuck? And there's still two more hours of this fucking movie? 
Like, you could have made a whole movie of just these two people talking to oh, each other. Yeah. And the fucking climax could have been finding the Jews underneath the house. Yeah. And I would have been fucking okay with that. Yeah. And then, you know, it kept going on and on and on. And I was just like, oh, this movie's a fucking masterpiece. Oh, it yeah. A fucking <laughs> masterpiece. I loved it. Yeah. I was so into it at the time. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, I remember, so it's like Kill Bill initially got me in. And then I think Inglorious Bastards was probably the next one I watched, which was just like, oh, kill the guy who made Kill Bill. Okay, I'll I'll give this a watch. And then yeah, I remember that initial opening scene. I was like, oh, I I am in for a motherfucking movie. Uh huh. And then it's just like yeah. And then got to the end and all that shit went down. I was just like, okay, this is this is Tarantino. Uh huh. This is what he's about. Not to go off topic. It's not quite off topic, but. What in your eyes makes a movie good? What does a movie have to have in it for Kyle Rose to be like, this is a fantastic movie? I would probably have to say... Because there are definitely movies that like I can't... like, Not that I can't or won't watch, but... For me personally, something with too much, too much hokey action. Yeah, I can understand. So like, I have a lot of issue with Michael Bay movies. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of issue with like the Die Hard, especially like the new Die Hard movies. I can understand that. Impossible or like the Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. No, I can I can go to those and I can turn my brain off and just enjoy the crap that's happening that's obviously like okay yeah none of this is real it's just like as as long as the movie that i'm going there and watching knows what is going on and it's not taking itself seriously i can get behind it but it's like well for me but i disagree i feel like they do take themselves seriously i feel like that's the whole point of those movies i don't know because it's like i i watch like other movies like for me like that movie wanted I don't feel like that movie was like, oh, this is definitely set in the real world. It's like, no, this is set in a universe where bullshit like this can actually happen. I mean, okay, okay, I guess I see. It's kind very, of where you're it's very from aware here. that this kind that, of shit can't this, happen. This shit can't Whereas, happen like, here. Fast and Furious tries to play it off like, well, if the circumstances were just right, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of yeah, which I don't like. like I don't know, because it's like, I kind of stopped. I think I stopped after the second Fast and Furious. Yeah, and I, 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 I like never eight. watched any of the new ones. I, I yeah. think I, wa- I stopped after I Tokyo remember Drift. watching. Yeah, no, I remember watching the trailer for Tokyo Drift. And I'm like, I'm probably going to pass on that one. <laughs> Which is funny, because, and mind you, I haven't seen all the Fast and Furious no. movies. But Tokyo Drift, out of the first three, Tokyo Drift was my favorite movie. Really? Yeah, it That's was. Funny. And it's funny because it has none of the original characters from the that like the first two movies that in there. Sense. But I don't know. I really like the ja- anything that basically has Japanese shit in there. Right. So, no, that, you know, that, that makes did. sense. Again, that's why I fell in love with Kill Bill. Yeah, I feel yeah, I feel yeah, one hundred. It's like ooh, katanas. <laughs> that was you know teenager Kyle. Um, but yeah, okay. So going back to what makes a film good for me personally, I would probably have to say, um, it, it's it's smart with its execution. Okay like dialogue or whatever it's trying to accomplish in the set of the movie. And then I would have to say good, really good continuity and foreshadowing. Okay. Why is foreshadowing important to you? I think foreshadowing, because it's basically my way of saying something that... Because both those things are pretty broad. Because you can even yeah, have well, foreshadowing and continuity, like perfection in like a... A bullshit action movie that we were just sure. talking about. But I'm saying when it's used well, I think it's probably the little add-on I would say to that. Because like, if a movie knows what it's doing, is is smart with its dialogue or where it's going, and then it in like wherever it like decides to bring something back from the beginning of the movie or however it's going about it, and it's just like this was here the whole time and it just brushed right by you. It's like to have that kind of continuity and foreshadowing. So you like movies that have, there's a word for it, that has, mm, what's it called? 
there's there's a there's a term for it, like rewatch value or yeah. something. You know, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you can go back and watch it and it and can have become a, a different new, movie. Because yeah, and have a new experience. Things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think those are probably some of my favorite movies. Because again, I think even when we were talking uh, last time for Podcast 100, we went over our top five movies. Yeah, and I, I can't remember if that one made it into the podcast or not because of the technical difficulties. Yeah, but. I, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. But yeah, so my top five, and it's like they all kind of follow that kind of theme. Back to the Future, continuity and paying attention to the little things plays a huge role in Back to the Future. True, yes. Because it's just like immediately, it's like, dude, noticing the real small things like watching it over and over again. Watching Twin Pines Mall turn into Lone Pine Mall because yeah. he ran over the tree. Yeah, little things like little that. Little things like that. That is, oh, that, that really gets me. It's like when attention to detail is taken very seriously. Okay. And uh, I think like oh, my one of my other ones, Inception, in t- attention to detail plays True. a, a very right. big You're role. Right. Uh, Fight Club, dude, the entire. Oh, all the, all, all of, of it Fight is attention, attention to, to detail. detail. Yeah. And then it's like, calls back on itself so it's like yeah a lot of foreshadowing there and it's being very smart with its execution to make sure it doesn't step on its toes so nothing so something doesn't make sense after you find the twist right so shit like that it's like it doesn't have to have a twist but as long as it pays attention because it's like yeah back to the future doesn't have a twist but its attention to detail is so magnificent right so it's like really like those movies and i think uh i don't remember what my whole top five were but it's just like, yeah, it basically comes down to that. It's like as long as there's like really good detail in everything and like the, yeah, basically rewatch value would probably be a big thing. Because it's like if I can watch a movie once and then have a totally different experience watching it again, uh huh, that's what makes a good movie for me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. I really enjoy the movies where one of my favorite movies right now, probably, with how much I talk about it, I, I probably have to put it at my number one spot, honestly. <laughs> and which is, one would that be, Adam? Uh, Mother. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I knew we were yeah. going to go there. <laughs> it's, I'm, uh, I smitten. talk about it a lot. You're really smitten am, with it. You, you know what? I'm smitten with Darren Aronofsky. Yes, you are. The director and writer of these films. Well, yes, yes. Because... I, I don't know what it is, dude. He just makes these fucking fantastic films, and I feel like he's such a overlooked filmmaker. You know, he's he's one of those filmmakers that's for the filmmakers. I think a lot of the times. Oh, I can understand that. And but it's such a shame because I feel like he does these movies that are just they're they're just fucking mind blowing. Yes. You know, I mean, kind of going what you were talking about with rewatchability, right? Mm-hmm. So the reason why I bring up Mother a lot is because Mother has a lot of that for me. Yeah. And I don't feel bad about spoiling this because it's been out for a while. And <gasps> if you listen to this yes. podcast, I've talked about it several fucking times. So if you haven't watched it at this point, sorry, but you need to fucking watch it. You could still watch it when I spoil it and you'll love it. Okay. And... That's that's also a good mark. It's a big mark of a good movie. As if true, You're even right. if spoiled, yeah. still makes it a good movie. So Mother, and I feel like I may have explained what Mother is before on a podcast, but I'm just going to reiterate it now. But so Mother is literally so same thing that you were talking about with like Tarantino films. It all takes place in one fucking house. Ooh, they don't yeah. go outside at all. They go on the front porch a couple times. Right. right, you see things happening on the outside of the house, but it takes place in one house. Mm-hmm. And what's fantastic about it is, and what's unique about it, the entire film is a retelling of the Bible. Oh yeah, yeah, you the have entire that. fucking thing. That's is it, beautiful. They, they start from creation and they go all the way to fucking revelations, and they do fucking everything. That's pretty beautiful. everything. Yeah, and so the entire thing is this interpretation of what if you took all the stories in the Bible, but you had it happen between this like couple, and the and what's craziest? What's craziest? Is you have the main guy in there who's obviously God, and if the but the movie follows Jennifer Lawrence, who's his like wife, his girlfriend, wife. They never really say, but 
and you you get this interesting interpretation of Jennifer Lawrence isn't just you know the universe right mm-hmm. she, the, the they kind of played off as she's the canvas right but it's more so of she is the devil like that is what it's it, that is what it's really playing down to right but the thing is the entire movie is making you have sympathy for this being that we have been taught to hate through this means of interpretation oh yeah through Darren Aronofsky's eyes and that right there mm-hmm. is the fucking pediment of that movie and I'm somebody personally, and I think the reason why that movie in particular, aside from his other works, really like I like a lot is because I'm really in to the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible, but I'm into Bi- I'm into the stories in the Bible like people are into Greek mythology. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand. So that. I I love the stories. I love interpreting them in my head. I love hearing how other people interpret it. Mm-hmm. I love listening to that kind of stuff. The the stories in the Bible really do fascinate me. The concept of God and the devil really fascinate me. The concept of how the devil used to be an angel and now is it, you know, because he tried to go against God. that all that fascinates me. Right. So I finally got this film that's literally this person, Darren Aronofsky, who it must have fascinated him also because he made a whole fucking movie about it. Right. And it was just this really broad, interesting interpretation of it. Hell yeah. And I think it, and when it comes to movies, that's what I really enjoy is watching people's interpretations of things. So another perfect example of that is, have you heard of the newest movie out called Midsommar? I have heard about it, but I haven't like really looked into any so I watched trailers it. or anything. I went to go see it. Okay. So, excuse me, my nose is stuffy. But so this is done by a director named Ari Aster. Okay. Okay. And he did a movie beforehand that I saw a horror flick that was fantastic, by the way, called Hereditary. Okay. Did you like the movie The Shining, Kyle? Oh hell yeah! Then you'll love Hereditary. Good. To it's know. got a, it's got a very like shining kind of feel to it. Ah, see, and and that's definitely something else because I feel like I do need to watch more of uh, Kubrick's films because I do enjoy a lot of them. Yeah, he's 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 definitely a good one as far as his artistic oh, yes. and stylism, you know. But the reason why going back to like the open or the the interpretation aspect, right? Right. Is so the way that the director described Hereditary in Midsommar, right, was Hereditary was, without giving too much away, was basically something big happens to affect this family, right? So the way that Ari Aster explained it was anybody outside looks at the movie Hereditary and goes, it's a horror flick. No, it is not. It is a it is a movie about a family tragedy, but it's played out through all of these metaphors that makes it play out like a horror movie. Hmm. Now, metaphors to the extreme extent of a metaphor right. to the point to where, you know, it's quote unquote real, but it, that's really what it is. Midsummer was a very I wouldn't call it a horror flick. It was a very dis- disturbing, interesting film. But the film, the purpose of the film that he said was it was really, though, about a breakup because there's two characters in there who are dating, who are kind of reaching the end of their relationship. Mm. So the whole thing was meant to make you feel like somebody does when they're going through a breakup. Interesting. And he did it in this way of this Swedish cult kind of thing going on with it. But that was the whole purpose of the movie. So the entire thing... just to thing, take something else that would make you feel a certain way that would be similar enough yes, to the exactly. same thing that you would feel in a breakup. It was literally him... His interpretation of a family tragedy, his interpretation of a breakup, right? You know, where it's you know, 
mother was Darren Aronofsky's interpretation of the Bible. Those are the films that I fucking love, are films that are interpretations. Darren Aronofsky has another movie called The Fountain, which is okay. kind of along the lines of like what Ari Aster was doing as a director with his films, mm -hmm. where the entire thing was just that littered with metaphors and hyperboles and all that other shit, you know, visual hyperboles and metaphors, of course. Right. But it was really about lost, you know, it was about a, a man who lost his wife and, and how he was going through that and the interpretation of what that is. Right. And so it's surrealism, I guess is yeah, really the, yeah. the broad term for it. But Ugh, those are the movies that do it for me, man. And I always get so fucking bothered, so fucking bothered when I watch those kind of movies with people and the person that I'm with doesn't fucking get it. That bothers <laughs> the hell out of me. That is Adam's biggest pet peeve. It is. Because I feel like there is a... I hesitate to say this because... I don't want this to come off as an insult to anybody who's watched these movies and didn't get it, but I feel like there's a there's a certain kind of level of intelligence in that realm that you have to have right. to be able to like understand and appreciate those kind of films. Right. You know, I mean, I remember I went to go see Hereditary with a girl I was dating at the time, and we left that theater and I was just like, "Wow." Like, wow, what a fucking movie. And she was just like, I don't get it. And I should have known right there that that relationship was not going to fucking work. Right there, I should have fucking known. I don't get it. All right, well, then you can leave. I don't get it. Like, what was going on? But, oh, I don't know, dude. It's, it's movies like that, though, that I always have to kind of go back and watch and be like, oh, this is why I like filmmaking. Mm -hmm. This is why I want to be a director. This is it's why really I It's really storytelling. This. It is. But, like, just to the... The point of seeing a movie is, you know, you said something earlier about when you go see, like, these Fast and Furious movies and such, that you'll go into the movie and you'll shut your brain off, right? Yeah. You'll, you'll shut your brain off and you'll just watch the film. But I disagree. I don't think that's... I'm not saying you were saying those are good movies, but I don't think that's no. what makes a movie a movie. A movie no. is something that you go into the theater and it forces your brain to work. You have but to like I don't pay think, attention. I don't think all movies are like that. Uh, I, I mean, think I think you have different genres when it comes to movies because I think there are some movies where you're just there to just bullshit and have a good time. I think yeah. you're, I think you're just there like because I think those action movies are very much that way where it's just. Come here, you, you just want to see shit explode and people do crazy stunts and everything. Well, this is what you came to see. Right. It's, it's why I don't think X Games is as big as it was when we were younger, but I think it's why a lot of kids watched X, watched Games. X Games. Just to see some crazy bullshit. Yeah. And it's just like, you, you didn't go in there to like, hmm, full, you know... Well, let take me, a philosophical look at what they were doing. Well, let me, let me phrase it this way. So you use the analogy of like the X Games, of people just wanting to watch it because they want to see people do fun tricks and stuff like yeah. that, right? But I think when somebody watches the X Games, even if you and I were to watch them now, it's the same reason I think why people watch the Olympics, is because there's a level of appreciation of like, wow, that guy just went off this ramp with that fucking three-wheeler wheeler and did three backflips with a twist before landing on all three wheels. Yeah, so wheels, you, you, know? you appreciate the accomplishment. Yeah, so exactly. So there's an appreciation that's there. Whereas when you go into these shut your brain off movies like Fast and Furious or some of the newer diehards, I would argue, uh -huh. I, I don't feel like there's really an appreciation aspect of any no, of it. No, because there's not really anything to accomplish. It's just action for action's sake. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, I, I guess it comes to like, I get what you're saying about those are movies that people just go to have fun in. Mm -hmm. But... There are people I know who those are their favorite movies. I mean, hey, I, I get it. if Because it's like, I know I know how seriously some people take Fast and the Furious because there are some people out there 
that can't hear that song that was played at the end of the last Fast and Furious, where Whichever one Paul Walker Paul died Walker in, died yeah. in, and they just swell up every time they hear that. Really? Song. Yeah. Interesting. Because like, it's like they were just so attached to the Fast and Furious movies and really, really liked Paul Walker as an actor. I guess it's just if I guess it just kind of depends the nostalgia that's. Uh, but see, connected the, to it, too. the way I kind of look at it as well is, well, you know, there's also people that really think uh, Big Bang Theory and Two and a Half Men are hilarious, that are just endlessly I, I think those, comedic. I think those shows are funny, Kyle. I mean, hey, do power, you, power to you, man. Do you not think they're funny? I, I don't think they're very smart with their comedy. Get the fuck out. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, no, no, I, I don't. But I, I totally get where you're coming from because I know a lot of people who feel that same way. Yeah, I, and I, I think it comes down to well, I feel like people will tell you that about any sitcom, any sitcom that has a laugh track that's basically telling you this is where you're supposed to laugh. True. It's just like here, let let's not let you find out what's funny. Let's tell you what's funny. Did How I Met Your Mother have a laugh track? No. How I Met Your Mother didn't have a laugh Friends track. has a laugh track. Friends though. has a laugh track. How do you that feel about 70 Friends? That 70 show has a laugh track. How do you how do you feel about those shows? Like Friends or That 70 show? Like, the reason why I'm asking is because, like, Big Bang Theory and Two and a Half Men, I get it when people use those two shows because those mm-hmm. are both created by the same person. Right. So there's the same kind of comedy that comes from both those shows. Yes. But and I about- think I think it's definitely that comedy. It's I understand where people attack those shows because it's like i've recently seen a lot of people showing like uh you know the funniest episode of friends that like probably got the highest rating or had the most jokes per you know episode Mm -hmm. and compare that to like the office right and why they personally feel because i guess it's all comedy is always subjective of course so it's like why they feel that in the end the office is just a superior show comedic wise right than friends would ever be Okay. How do you feel about like Friends or that 70s show? Um, I think there Given that you don't like the laugh tracks. Um, again, it's like there there was a time and a place cuz it's like there was a time where I was just binging all of that 70s show. Yeah. And, same. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, yeah, you know, it has its moments. There's stuff I find funny, but it's just like I think, you know, as you find other shows that do comedy in a different way that you're more appreciative of, Mm -hmm. you start seeing where the other shows that did it differently aren't as funny as what you've now found. Once you find like a new medium where you're like, wow, that's amazing. And it makes the old medium feel like crap in comparison. You're like, Mm -hmm. well, of course I thought that was great. I didn't know this existed. Right. (laughs) Touche, touche. When it comes, one thing I'll say, you brought up The Office. Mm -hmm. I truly do not understand the fandom with The Office. I don't. Really? I don't. So Interesting, and because I've, I am one of those mega fans. Well, and this is coming from somebody where I have seen all the episodes of The Office multiple times, because mm-hmm. it is a show that I have put on in the background before. Right, right? yeah. No, that's basically what our house is now at, at my home, is yeah. just office in the background. Because right. my wife doesn't care about Scrubs, which is the only other show that I watch religiously. Aww. I know. She doesn't find <laughs> it as funny. She finds it childish, and I'm just like, well... I was, you know, childish when I fell in love with it. So I, it has I, nostalgia. I enjoyed Scrubs. I wasn't a diehard. I didn't like watch it. I haven't seen every episode S- yeah, of Scrubs. S- Scrubs, but... Scrubs in the Office are definitely two diehards. Ones where I can pretty much tell you the exact episode based off of one scene. Mm-hmm. Like I do know you recently posted on Facebook. That <laughs> yeah, you... I found that so funny. Okay, so I recently posted like uh, I've been having fun recently with Facebook's version of stories how instagram has stories right and so i've been having fun with that for the past couple days and i posted a video of my mom's dog just sitting on like our rocking chair or something and i just put some stupid comment on with it right and kyle and i had the office playing in the background it was just on tv and Kyle wrote or commented on this and was and told me, oh, and you have the office on in the background. Like, good for you. And mind you, you could hardly hear you the television. Hear. Okay? So what? The story was maybe like 10 seconds. Yeah. If that. If that. 
So one, not only could I hear The Office, I heard enough of the lines going on to know that the episode that was playing on in the background was the one where they, uh, the, where Michael takes over for Toby to deal with all of the inner office turmoil, and it was the part where Dwight was coming in with all of the pranks Jim had ever done to him. Damn. Yes. Damn. Damn. Yes. <laughs> that much of man because. I, me and my wife have seriously watched The Office that many fucking times. See, I so I enjoy The Office. Don't care for it after Michael Scott left. Just we, do not care. As far as I'm concerned, seasons eight and nine don't exist. Yeah, yeah. And so did not care for when Michael Scott left. I think it actually went like three or four seasons after he left. Uh, it might have gone to ten. But well, we just know after season seven ends, we just start over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but one show that I do really like a lot more than The Office, that's that same kind of setup, that same kind of humor, that mockumentary style, Parks, Parks and Recreation. And Rec. yes. Parks and Recreation. I love Parks and Recreation. I, I get it. They, they definitely used the setup that The Office had and mm-hmm. ran with it. And I understand the Parks and Recreation fandom. You know, it's like, especially if I can sit there and just fall in love with The Office as I have, I can totally understand Parks and Rec and what they're trying to do. And I think it is hilarious. I think probably one of the best jokes that ever happened on Parks and Rec got cut out of it. Which joke? If you've watched the outtakes, I've for, watched a lot of the, outtakes, the outtakes. Yeah, the Kim Kardashian joke Andy Blair makes. Oh my gosh, that's the like one that everybody posts about. Oh yeah, yeah. because the, it, it was the outtake, and yeah. it's like if it had made it. Well, of course, it was of course, way yeah. too risque. Of course, too it, true. Way, way too, too true. risque. For, well, and not for to the mention show. they all cracked up laughing like immediately yeah. after he said it. So that but. and like that's <laughs> another thing. It's like when it comes to comedy. I think it is so fucking important you know how to keep your cool in a scene. Yes, I agree. Which is why I have that appreciation for The Office, because Steve Carell is one of those, I would say, masters of just going on with the scene, regardless of how funny it is, and ad-libbing, and just making it good, and just staying in character the entire time. I think we also see that in that 70s show with Ashton Kutcher. Do, Do we... Um, well, I know there was particularly one outtake where, uh, Ashton Kutcher's character was messing with a megaphone and it just went off and made all this sound. He stayed completely in character the entire time. But then it was whoever was playing the sister at the time, because I know they changed Eric's sister halfway through. Yeah. She busted up laughing and ruined the scene so they couldn't use it. Uh huh. So it's just like, dude, Ashton Kutcher had that down. He was like fumbling with it. It was going off, making all this noise. He got it back together and turned it off, and she's dying laughing there. I'm like, dude, come on. Right. That would have made a great scene. No, that's true. I, I think, I don't know, when it comes to like, Parks and Rec versus The Office. Yeah, because they're the most comparable. Yeah. The reason why I like Parks and Rec more is because every character in Parks and Rec is vastly different from each other. Oh, they all absolutely stand out. I completely understand that. Whereas when you get into The Office, like... I mean, obviously Dwight is different than Jim. Jim is different than Pam. Pam is different than Michael Scott. I So all that's there. But the levels of which they're different, it's like they're a bunch of... So let me, let me use this analogy. It's like all the characters as far as their differences between each other and the way they act and their dynamic is like a bunch of hills up and down up and down whereas parks and rec it's like mountains yeah right now i get that and i would definitely credit that to all of the characters in the office have to pertain to an office environment so they are all characters that are still represented and would fit in an office whereas in parks and rec i feel you get a while they are working in the parks and rec department you get a lot of what's happening outside of that. Yes, I agree. And I you, think I enjoyed that a lot more. Yes. The Office, you get that a little, little bit. bit but, but the majority of the showtime is inside the office. Yes, you're right. So I would absolutely agree with you there. So it's just like, yes, the fact that they do it. Because that's also why I love Scrubs. 
not all of Scrubs takes place inside the hospital. A mm-hmm. lot of the stuff pertains to what's happening outside of the hospital. Right. So I completely understand that. But so that's why I'm just like, I understand that, yes, they have to contain themselves because they're all in this work environment. Whereas Parks and Rec, you see a lot of what's going on outside, especially like Leslie Nope's whole thing in politics. Right. You know, uh, is it Ben? The Her husband. Her husband. Quote unquote husband in yeah. the show. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, he's all about his nerddom half the time. Right. You have, uh, and see, of course, the other reason why I have that love for Parks and Rec's as well is because they have uh chris pratt uh n- yeah chris pratt's good too <laughs> but uh the oh, i can't remember the actor's name the one that's always exercising and about his body oh rob low rob, rob low i yeah. fucking love rob low as yeah. an actor and it's just like i appreciated him in parks and rec but it wasn't until my wife started showing me the west wing where i'm just like rob low oh is he's so great. good he's great well and i think one thing that parks and rec did really well that i think the office was certainly lacking on wasn't just the the fact of things happening outside of the office but it was the contrast of characters and who they put up with each other so for example we learned um briefly in film school we were talking about comedy and stuff like that right so we talk about like some of the simple things that a lot of people know like the rule of threes right yeah you know, the first two things are the same the third time it happens it's different right, right. yeah and uh <clears throat> and then but we also talk about things of what characters you put next to each other right so if you're doing like a comedy movie for example now what's going to be funnier is it going to be funnier watching a movie let's say the movie's about a married couple now what's immediately going to be more comical than the other to just average people with maybe contrasting different personalities sure that are like coupled with each other or now all of a sudden you add that dynamic of of the the wife is a midget and the husband six foot two yeah right? something drastic so yeah those drastic changes Parks and Rec, I felt like, did this fantastic. And here are the difference with the characters. So you have Leslie Nope and Ron Swanson, right? Leslie Nope loves Parks and Rec. She loves the government. She loves the due process. She's also very high energy. Nick yeah. Offerman, mm-hmm. or Ron Swanson, hates the government. And very He's low. literally the complete opposite of Leslie Nope. And you have to watch them interact. Exactly. Now, going back to what you said about Rob Lowe, the really positive, super exercising, who do they team him up with? They team him up with Ben, who's the who, when he first comes into the show, is the negative Nancy. Like, we have to do work. Yeah. We can't be positive Complete all the time. Opposites. Complete opposite. So, or... Perfect example again. Chris Pratt uh, playing Andy and Aubrey Plaza playing. Uh... God, what oh. the fuck was her name? What is in her this name show? There? I just watched an episode of it too. Oh man, April. 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 Who plays April? Right, like. April's the like down goth, you know, wants to be weird girl. And right. Chris Pratt's the like, like, all right, guys, I'm the little kid. Let's do something today. And, and yeah, Fart jokes. Yeah, <laughs> and they and they make they make a good couple. But see, I think that's I just, just don't feel like you get. The, sorry to cut you off, but those are the things that I feel like the office is missing. Like when Jim and Pam get together, for example, when Jim that whole relationship, it's like, well, that makes sense. Like, look at them. You obviously look at them and you're like, oh, they're the ones who have to be together. You didn't look at April and Andy in Parks and Rec and say, oh, those are the characters well, that need also, to be together. Well, also, that's also because... There are people listening right now who have never watched either of those shows uh, who are just like, what the fuck are they talking about? It's hard. <laughs> it's hard to talk to those people because when you look at it, Netflix's demographic the Office is the most watched show on Netflix. Is it? Yes. Was that confirmed? And, yes, it now beat out Friends. Taking it off? Yeah, in 2021 because NBC bought it back. Oh, fuck them. Yeah. I so bet they're, they're trying to do their own streaming service or they some are. shit now too. Yeah, they are. Everybody's trying to take their pick at Netflix by doing Netflix's thing. Right. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I mean, look at Disney, Disney+. Plus. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyways, you look at Parks and Rec... And look at its first season. Fucking terrible. Its first season is fucking terrible because at that point they have Chris Pratt, 
with uh, what is Rashida Jones, and yeah, yeah, because that's her character. Which again, she played a prominent role in The Office as well. Oh yeah, she did, didn't she? Yes, she did. So you have her with Chris Pratt, and Chris Pratt is this deadbeat boyfriend that she's just with. So you already hate Chris Pratt's character, right? And then they immediately flip that around once they start getting into the second and third season with you know him trying to and getting with April, which those two characters do not mix at all, but. The fact that they don't makes them such a good couple. Yes. And then I think, because it's like, I think where Parks and Rec really started taking off for me, because I had heard how good Parks and Rec was, because I saw the Ron Swanson and Bacon memes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I initially found out about Parks and Rec. Good old memes. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so I started watching it, and I watched that first season, and I was like, this show is like garbage. What What does everybody see in it? Right. And it's like, especially because it's like, I also feel bad that, what was the one actor that was like uh, Leslie was into? And oh, then he was only in like the first two he's seasons. Only in the first two yeah. seasons, and then he's just gone and never heard from him again. It's like, wow, you really missed the boat. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even know why he left. Actually, I, I have I can't remember no if it was, like, idea. A money issue, or his character just wasn't doing well. Or yeah, what it was. Yeah, I mean, it could have been his character not doing well because his character was not doing well. <laughs> True. But, yeah, so it's like, I think it wasn't really until they started getting a little bit further that they started focusing on the other characters and developing them. And then also, as soon as they started bashing on Jerry. Yes. Because it's like, and it feels like, and then I feel like that's kind of something they took from The Office as well. Because, and I don't feel like The Office is the one that originated that. I feel like every, like, real big comedy show has to have, like, that one character that they bash on. Mm. Because The Office has Toby, which is HR. Okay. Parks and Rec has uh, Jerry. Jerry. Um, Gary, Jerry, Larry. <laughs> yeah, whatever his actual name is. And he always does so well for himself. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I feel like you even have that in other... Well, it's like it's... I guess they usually just shift it around and it's just the comic relief that gets bagged on. Because it's like that 70s show, Ashton Kutcher's character was the one getting bagged on half the so time. So I think that's the difference. So I think when you're getting into sitcoms... Right, mm-hmm. so sitcoms, regardless whether there's a laugh track or not, right? Sitcoms. Well, sitcoms are usually the only ones with laugh track. The situational comedies. Well, no, because I would argue that How I Met Your Mother is a sitcom, but that did not have a laugh track, but that mm-hmm. did follow the same equation. Yeah. That Friends kind of set. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Because if you look at it, Friends started it. How I Met Your Mother took it off from where they left off and kept going. So How I Met Your Mother was the new Friends. Parks and Rec was the new Office. Right. So it's like you kind but, of see where that where but train for, was going. But even regard, but even other than How I Met Your Mother, like Big Bang Theory did it too. So let's look at Friends, for example, right? Yeah. So you have Joey, which is obviously the funny, stupid one, right? Mm-hmm. You have Chandler, which is like the the sarcastic like smart but sarcastic you know kind of the comedy relief when joey is not the comedy relief which i always thought chandler was always the funniest character i did too but joey was the dumb one right you know he He was was the lovable one he was the lovable so then you had um then you had uh rachel and ross which are the couple the dream couple Mm -hmm. right there's always the dream couple yep and then you had Phoebe, which was the lackadaisical one, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, the hippie. And then you had... Monica. Monica, who was the neurotic one. Yes. So now, if you look at a lot of sitcoms, you can look at the equals. So let's look at that 70s show, for example. You know, Rachel is the Donna, right? Yep. Uh, Ross is the Eric. Mm-hmm. Chandler is the Hyde. Joey yep. is the who's Ashton Michael Michael right yeah there you go uh, Monica was the Jackie right so you have those equals in there yeah now. yeah you have the parallels so you have the same thing now with How I Met Your Mother right now while How I Met Your Mother did a little differently was based was that the Ross character which was the main character in How I Met Your Mother sorry I don't know his name Ted but, um, Ted. And how I met your mother did not was you, you you knew there was a dream couple coming, but you just didn't know until the end. Hence, how I met your mother. Well, right? no, they still kind of had the dream couple because that would be Ted and Robin. But but I would not 
Because that's how it started. Okay, you're right. You're right. The show okay, started. But then my point still stands. Yes, your point stands. So you have I'm helping Ross. you out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you have Ross and Ted. Ted. You have Rachel and Robin. You have uh, Neil Pat. Neil Patrick, Patrick Barney, Barney was basically the Joey character, yep. right? Uh, I would argue that uh, the, the guy who was married to the redhead. Uh, yes, that is Marshall. Marshall was the Chandler. Yep. And then the redhead was Monica, right? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So well, then we leave out Phoebe because we don't have a Phoebe character. Uh, okay, I guess you're right. Maybe in that one we don't. But, but then again, maybe you could just say Phoebe's the ever revolving door of girlfriends that Ted goes through. Touche. <laughs> that's a good point because I would actually go back and reprise what I called Phoebe, and I would call instead of lackadaisical, I'd call her the wild card. Right. Oh, there you go. The yeah. wild card. And Always the wild card. How much of a bigger wild card do you have than a revolving door of girlfriends? Exactly. So, and they're usually crazy girlfriends, right? Uh huh. So now you go and you relate that to Big Bang Theory. And same thing. Ross is Leonard. Rachel is Penny. Um, Chandler is Howard. Uh, and you can go on and on and on. So, friends, well, there's definitely. I mean, there's you, an, there's a fucking can, equation. There is an know? equation because not only do but that's why not I, only do comedies do this equation, but the family cartoons do this equation too. Yes, you're absolutely right. Family Guy, you can pick the same characters Family, and family guy, guy and Family Guy took from Simpsons. Simpsons. Yeah, because yeah. Simpsons... Simpsons is basically the one that started the cartoon comedy family oh, thing. Oh, for sure. For and sure. everybody's been copying them since. Yes, for sure. So, but... Um, but there's there's a fucking equation to it. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, going going back to like what I was saying um, originally, that's why I would consider How I Met Your Mother a uh, sitcom. Yeah. Now, well, relating this back to what we were talking about in regards to The Office or Parks and Rec, is The Office really jump started? Now, I would argue that shows like Scrubs started it before The Office, but The Office really did kind of jump start this. M- Mockumentary movement? Mockumentary, dramedy kind of thing going on, right? Mm-hmm. No, I'd agree. And I think if you look at shows like The Office or Parks and Rec or Scrubs, you, there's a there's a different dynamic in the characters, but you can still find ones oh, that yeah. relate to each one. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? There just happens to be more going on than that. Because I think that's the big thing with Parks and Rec and The Office is they probably have the most ongoing characters. Yes, Because it's not just, oh, here's your five, and that's your core five, and that's who you're going to stick with. Yes. It becomes, okay, here's your main characters in the group, but you're always going to have your side characters in the background that all play a big role. And it's just like, that's what it becomes, because it's like... Because that's what The Office was, too. It was like four or five main characters than everybody else. Yeah, basically four. Because you had Jim and Pam, which was the relationship everybody was waiting to see happen. Dwight, which was your big comedy role, was your guy the neurotic guy that gets picked on and michael scott who was your comedy relief yes everybody else was side characters and that's how the office initially started nobody cared about the side characters but as the show picked up speed and kept going now all your side characters have to have their own story yes and that's where it becomes it's like that's where i'm like no you totally see the story of everybody else in the office Creed is the crazy old guy yeah. that nobody has any idea what the hell's <laughs> going on with him. Angela's the super neurotic one that mm-hmm. everything has to be perfect and ends up with Dwight. Right. You know, you have Meredith, which is just the old drunk old lady you yeah, know the old you know, the alcoholic lady. woman yeah. yeah oscar's the gay one oscar's uh, the gay you know one. you have the kevin's the fat one yeah exactly and then you have like this uh duo between stanley and phyllis because it's like oh well they got their own kind of thing going on they're kind of like the grouches almost yeah exactly <laughs> like oh set in their ways kind of thing but yeah, so it, it's weird to see these, and I think that's why, for example, Friends did so well, right? And it goes back to originality, and it goes back to a lot of the issues I have in Hollywood right now is lack of originality. Oh, absolutely. You know, the reason why I mean, Friends, look at Disney. Yeah, no original, yeah, no yeah, originality. Disney's, yeah, exactly. Disney's fucking notorious for it. And But you look at Friends, and why was Friends so popular? Because it was original. They, yeah. they started the fucking equation. Yeah. Now, why was The Office so popular? 
Well, they started the fucking equation, yeah. you know? And yeah, there are people going back to the analogy of Disney, you know, Disney found an equation that works and they just constantly repeat it and they change the characters and places each yeah. time. The happily, uh, once upon a time, blah, 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 married happily ever after. But I would argue too that that is why Frozen was such a big hit when it came out. Because it changed Because it. Frozen deviated from that original And they shoved it in your face. They shoved it in your face. Yes. Look, we're not doing the formula. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of what upset me because in my opinion, I thought Tangled was way better than Frozen. Oh, I did too. 100%. So much better. However, you can't deny that Tangled followed, followed the, the formula. Th- yeah, no, it absolutely followed the formula. And so I, I, I completely understand that. There goes that chair again. <laughs> that fucking chair, dude. I know. But, but, yeah, I mean, I get it. I I understand the, the love for Parks and Rec. You know, I, I watched it. I, I enjoyed it. But it just it ends up coming time after time that it's like I go back to the office. And I don't know what it is with this mockumentary style that it's just so easy to go back and watch again. Well, it, I mean, it has to be compelling. But, I mean, think about it, though. What's another mockumentary-style show besides The Office and Parks and Rec that's right. come out? But, but then again, it's like, what is it about the mockumentary style that makes you want to watch it again? It's like, why do I want to watch that again where I don't care to watch How I Met Your Mother again well, or you, watch that 70s show again? Or... Well, you want to know what it is? It's a perfect mix of everything that con- American consumers want. So think true. about it. Or right, because it's so relatable. Well, it's it's not watching only rel- them going to like a nine to five kind of thing. Uh, yes and no. So, for example, Friends. Right, Friends was this start of this new. It wasn't that sitcoms didn't exist beforehand, but you had this like different equation now. This like golden equation that we found worked right, right. for the sitcom. Yeah, absolutely. And so people copied it, and we loved it. Then, as you got later into the 90s and the early 2000s especially, and mm-hmm. going forward, what what started to become big after that? Reality shows. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was reality fuck, shows. Fuck, look at our goddamn presidency. Yeah, exactly. You know, re- So reality shows hit big. So now, all of a sudden, you had this show called The Office, which, just to be clear... We know that The Office was based off of an English show, okay? Yeah, we know the UK not, Office. We know they're not the fucking first ones. Yeah, we but, get it. And, of course, we now know that just about every country wants to throw their hat into it because, like, just about every country has their own The Office. Yeah, exactly. But the point being, though, is you finally got this interesting mixture between the sitcom and the reality show. Yeah, you finally did. You had a really good comedy that made it feel like oh this is something that would happen in my life yeah especially it's like because the office hit big right when the boom of like office jobs becoming the new norm did it well yeah because like a thing be, that was happening well i don't know that it was like in the process of happening but i know now that it's just like 50 years ago factory work was the most common job now cubicle Working in a cubicle on a computer is the most common job. Okay, yeah, that's true. So it's just like, I feel like we finally have a show that represents the majority of what Americans are experiencing. Yeah. I mean, and it's true. I mean, I've I've worked I I've worked the cubicle jobs before, mm-hmm. and and it is true. You do have this weird. There, it is weird. Okay, so. Oh, excuse me. Just burp. Beer burp. Yum. But <laughs> so look, I've worked a lot of jobs. Okay. Yes. I, I've worked retail. I'm currently working retail. You know, right. I've, I've worked sales. I've worked, uh, you know, Walmart. I've been a barista. I've done a lot of different things, including, you know, clerical work. I've worked in cubicles mm-hmm. before. You know, I, I, one of my longest standing jobs was a cubicle job. Right. And it really is weird. Because there is this strange kind of family mentality that is gained through these cubicle jobs. And the reason why I say weird is because, and I noticed this in retrospect now, but there were friends that I had when I worked one, it was a call center, right? It was like an insurance call center. And... 
one thing I realized about there were some people at this job that I would hang out with on a regular basis outside of work. Yeah. But once I stopped working for that job, we would try to hang out again, you know, because like, why not? We've been hanging out all this time. Let's hang out again. And it just wasn't the same anymore. And I realized... Because you didn't have work to talk about. Because we didn't have work to bitch about. Yep. Specifically. No, that absolutely explains like why from my retail days, I don't have any of those friends anymore because Mm -hmm. I don't have a retail job to complain about. Yeah, exactly. And you don't realize how much of your conversations... Even even Vince. Vince is a perfect example because I used to work with Vince at this cubicle job. Now, Vince and I, you know, obviously we're friends beforehand. So that's why we still hang out now. But... There was a time when he worked for the same company that I did that if I went to go hang out with Vince at his house and we were sitting outside smoking cigarettes or doing whatever, like all we were talking about were bullshit calls that we got, the different instances we had to go in, how we solved this problem, bitching about this customer. Oh, well, that's nothing. I had this customer. Did you hear what Susan did? Yeah, I heard that. Everybody was talking about that. You get all of that kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, you get that, that and so once about. once you leave that job, it's like you're leaving that world. So yeah. when you hang out with those people again, they're still enveloped in that world. You're not, so they can't be like, "Oh my God, Susan did this." I I don't know. I'm I'm not there anymore. I didn't right. know Susan did anything. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the weirdest thing, man. It's mm-hmm. it's it's interesting with jobs because I mean, especially here in America, because we we end up spending more time at work oh, with the absolutely. people we work with. We do. We, so, I mean, it always makes sense to me with the people who end up, like even my job now, there are people I know who have worked there for God knows how many years. So I'm just like, how, why? Yeah. But you get complacent. You, yeah. You, well, not only complacent, but that definitely has something to do with it. But you become so in, enveloped into this uh, this this weird family thing, right? So, for example, the current retail store that I work at right now, I remember uh, I was talking to somebody there, and I've worked for this place like uh, almost a couple years now, right? Yeah. And I remember talking with somebody there who I know who works in a different department, but I was telling her, I go, you know what? I think you and I are the last ones still here from our training class. Ah, oh, you know, that classic conversation. Yeah, everybody who was in our training class were the last ones. And just as you said, you know, oh, that conversation. Because now there is a camaraderie between me and that person, regardless of who they are. There is something that me and that person hold together yep. that nobody else has. And that is that we were in the training class here. We're in the together yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah no because it's like that's that's very human it's very yeah. human to like oh stick together with what you know and you know form a bond mm-hmm. because of bullshit yeah because <laughs> yeah it's exactly what it is you're forming a bomb i remember when i worked for walmart dude and this is a true story no fucking joke okay i worked for back in like 2011 i worked for walmart as if you live in arizona you've worked for walmart once Maybe you've okay. heard of them. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you've heard of them. Kind of a big deal. But here in Arizona, <laughs> especially in the Valley, there's literally a Walmart every fucking mile. Just, every mile yeah, away from each about, other. Yeah. If it's not a super center, it's a fucking neighborhood market. There's yeah. a Walmart. And so if you've lived here, you've worked at Walmart. And I worked at Walmart Guilty. for about... Yeah, I see. Point taken. So I worked at Walmart for about a year and a half. And I was like... 18 19 years old right yeah. so i was younger and to me it's just bullshit job i'm working at walmart whatever mm-hmm. but there really is a weird family complex oh yeah that happens when Dude, you work at walmart walmart has this family slash high school dynamic to it Yes, it's because there's so many people that work there. So many people. And it's it's not just... But the, you're still in close quarters with everybody. Well, no, no, no. It's not just the amount of people. It's also the type of people that you run into that work yes. at Walmart. Because Walmart does bring in the type of individuals that 
fit well into this family high school dynamic. Yes. Like, it just, it it's like, you know, I didn't think, like, I was one of those people, like, that, you know, would fall into the Walmart dynamic. Because uh-huh. it's like, I, but then again, I, I, too, was around that 18, 19 area right. when I joined them. Because it's like, my first job was at a gas station. So I moved from that to Walmart. And then it's just like, oh, well, you know, I don't fit in with these people. But yet I'm talking to them like they're an uncle I see every Thanksgiving. Yeah, exactly. So weird. It, it's, And when we say weird, guys, we mean like, like I said, I work at, at a major retail store, okay? So so we're, we're big. You know, we're... Uh, and when I mean big, I mean like our particular store and square footage is big, you know. So there's a lot of people that work in the same building. And I know probably everybody, 98% of the people I'm on a first name basis with that I there work you go. with. Yeah, right? yeah. And, but it's still not the same as working at Walmart. Yeah. And the story that I was going to tell was when I quit Walmart, I put in my two weeks and everything. So everybody knew that it was coming up, that I was leaving. And... So, of course, my last day, you know, I had my favorites that I wanted to go specifically, personally say goodbye to. And, dude, there were people who were crying that I was leaving Walmart. There were people where I was like, I just go up to them. Like, I remember specifically there was a lady in customer service who I, you know, gone out on cigarette breaks with and shit. Yep. And older lady worked at Walmart for quite a few years at that point. And I went up to her and I just said, hey, I just wanted to say goodbye before I leave. And she just, she started hugging me and I, you start to get that shake. You feel Mm -hmm. that shake. And I was like, oh my God, this, she's crying. Like she is really sad to see me go. And I never seen that at a job before. Nor have I ever seen that sense Mm -hmm. at a job before. Yeah, no, it it is definitely this weird dynamic because it's like, for some reason it does become a thing because it's like hugging was a big thing of me leaving as well too. I've never had co-workers hug me besides Walmart. Yeah. It's weird. Like, to say it goodbye. Because it's like, I feel like all my other places I've worked was like some kind of professional, like, exit. Yeah. It's just like shaking hands. And it's like, oh, hey, see you around and whatnot. But it's like, no, at Walmart, it's like, oh, no, it's like, we're family. You got to come here. And it's like, we might not see you. Or, oh, hey, you know, feel free to stop by. We'll still be here. And it's just like, I remember after leaving Walmart, coming back to that Walmart maybe months later, and everybody being excited to see me getting more hugs because they hadn't seen me yeah. in months. You know what's crazy for me in regards to going back to Walmart? So I still live in the same, as do you, you know, the yeah. same general area that, you know, it's a, it's a few minute drive to get to the Walmart I worked at. And it's so weird because there are times where I'll go there for whatever reason and I'm walking through and obviously I've been gone long enough now to, I don't get, you know, the kind of like, Oh my God, it's Adam or whatnot. But like, and of course there's tons of new faces, but ever so often I walk in there and I look over at all the cashiers and I see a few cashiers and I'm just like, wow, you're still working here yeah i, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't gone back to my walmart in a long time but it, dude it was so funny because I, I think it was like one year it had been one year since i quit and i went back and like 95 percent of the cashiers i worked with all different yes so the turnaround rate well don't get me wrong like there there was a lot of people who were different also as i was mm-hmm. walking through but all of a sudden you would just like look over at the jewelry counter and you'd be like oh my oh, god shit. they're still here like i've been out of walmart for almost 10 years and you are you're in this like it'd be different if all they, have sudden, like, they have that well not the 10 year badge but like it'd be different if i went back and it's like oh like you're an assistant manager now oh you're like the assistant no. to the store manager now no, whatever it is you're still the same position yeah it's like you are still a cashier you are still in customer service like you've been doing this for the, i don't care how old you are you've been doing this for that fucking long i don't know whether to applaud you or fucking like cry for you (laughs) you know no and like like i was saying it's like that's probably the biggest thing it's like where i work now now that i went through and got my degree and you know got into software development and everything it was so funny that like the first place i went and interned at 
was the it was my first job out of retail basically Uh and it was the first job i went to where i didn't where the people i would talk to about work weren't immediately like man as soon as i'm done with college man as soon as you know so and so comes back or as soon as i get this big break i've been looking for i'm out of here right and it's just like i feel like when you go to retail that those are the only people working there nobody's like man i finally got into you know an assistant manager role at walmart mm, not, this is what i've been waiting not for. true not oh true. you ran into somebody like that well the the i think there's a, a i think there's a spectrum of of well, maybe you're maybe you're right. Maybe retail is just a bit too of a broad statement. Maybe. Because, for example, I agree with that in the case of Walmart or Target or any of the other major ones out there. That be, Walgreens, you know, places mm-hmm. like that. But when you get to something like a department store. I guess is the way to say it. So someplace like Macy's, JCPenney's, Nordstrom's, uh, Neiman Marcus, right? Those kind of places. Sears before they closed. Right. There, Those are the places where there are people who literally go to those jobs and they're like, this is going to be the career. And it's understandable too mm-hmm. because you can make a career right. out now, of those if, jobs. If I saw that, but it, it was just really interesting because what I was really, what I'm really trying to say out of that is like that internship was the first time I couldn't find anybody. I see what you're saying. Okay, like no. everybody was like, "This is the last." Stop. Yeah, like this was this was the stop. This is what I went to school for. So it was the first time I I went through that entire place, and nobody was like, "Man, once I get my big break, I'm out of here." Mm-hmm. So it's just like, I'm sure, yeah, there are people like, oh, they've made it into management or they've made right, it right, somewhere. Right. They're like, okay, yep, this is where I'm going. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, because it's like, yeah, you're going to, it's like even at Walmart, I'm sure you'll find some manager that's just like, man, one day I'm going to be a store manager here. I actually know a friend from high school that I was in drama class with who did that. He's a store manager. He's, he's a little younger than I am and he's a store manager now yeah. of a Walmart, dude. How much do you think a store manager makes at Walmart? I mean, it can't be like the best money. Is no, it? no, it's 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 definitely not the best, but I mean, prob- they can live off of it. I'm sure. Oh, but... they can definitely live off of it. I imagine probably maybe even more than what I'm making. You know what? I'm actually curious. I'm gonna Google this really quick. Do store- it. <laughs> Walmart store manager salary. Walmart store manager. All right, Anna. You are also going to have to entertain our lovely listeners oh, do you for have to about pee? a minute. <laughs> do you have to be Kyle? Yes. <laughs> go on and pee. I will go on. I will, I will read this. So, I'm looking up right now what store managers make at Walmart. And it's actually a very broad spectrum. So, I have zero fucking clue. I mean, I guess it just has to depend on what Walmart it is. But I'm getting thirty-two to $195,000 per year. I'm not sure how that works. Um, in f- Here, I'm reading something new. It says, in fact, the National Bureau of Economic Research found Walmart store managers make an average salary of $92,000 per year. Damn. Damn, I mean, it can't be that hard to be the store manager of a Walmart, right? There's no fucking way. There's no fucking way. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. If you want to be the store manager of a Walmart, more power to you, because I guess they make a lot, you know, a decent amount. But fuck, don't you want to do something else? Don't you want to, like, fly planes, you know, save countries? I'm just telling the people right now. Kyle just came back, guys. I'm I'm just, I'm just telling the people right now. I read on average. On average. Average. $92,000. Yeah. That's just, yeah. That seems like so much to me. For an entire store? Yeah. For a Walmart? A Walmart super center? How many employees you're seeing over? I mean... You know how many employees fuck. work at a super center, and you have to take care of what all of them. What the fuck does a store manager do? What does a Walmart store manager do? 
What is the job? If you're a Walmart store manager, feel free to comment down below and let us know what you do. But, like, seriously, though, because isn't your job to basically delegate your fucking pylons to go fucking delegate everybody uh, else? Yeah, I mean, technically. I mean, I'm sure there's probably, like, regional managers or whatever that you have to abide to. Well, sure, but here's here's the reason why this perplexes me, right? So... Obviously, when you're a store manager of any place or a manager of any place, the things that your higher ups are going to be asking you about is your numbers, right? Your sales. Yeah. Okay. When you get into retail stores like Walmart or even a lot of, well, department stores is different because that's like sales oriented as far as like commissions concerned and shit. Sure, sure. But, um, But when you get into retail stores like Target or Walmart or even fucking Walgreens, CVS, any of those Ralphs, wherever you're located at, any of those smaller places, you like you have to abide by policy. Yeah. There's policy you have to abide by that can restrict how much you are able to sell. Location can restrict yeah, how much you're it can able bottleneck to sell. you. Yeah. So how does one drive sales in a fucking Walmart supercenter? What do you, what things are you doing differently aside from the people that you hire, which you really don't have a fucking say in because that's the HR department. Technically. So really your job at that point when you become a store manager is either fire everybody and start off with a clean slate and hopefully and hire like a good HR person to hire good people and shit like right. that to make people want to come or I, I don't know man I'm I'm just dumbfounded I just truly don't understand No no I definitely expected store managers to make a, a pretty fucking good wage and it's just because it, it becomes position. But what you're talking about at that point can be applied to any business. Once you get so high up the chain, you have so many people under you. What is your job? Well, that's my point. That's my question. Mm-hmm. What is your job? Yeah. When, and, you, when you come to work every day, what do you do? Yes. And I I've, you know, wonder about that with like CEOs and everything about like once you are up to that level that you're you're not even management. You're uh, oh, what are, what are they? It's almost like a different term for when you're on like executives. There you okay. go. So you're you're executive level. You're CEO. You're you're some kind of officer okay. of the business. You know whether it's a technical officer, an executive officer, a financial officer. It's like everything you need to do is basically just making sure the people under you are doing what they're supposed to right yeah so it's just it really becomes it's like outside of that it's like i i guess like your job is appearances but it's like if you're not the ceo and you're not actively working on mergers and that's where i was trying to to obtain more business because ceos are just that like their their job is to make the make sure the business stays profitable, right? You know? Yeah. But when you're the store manager of a Walmart, you have to abide by the policy that the Walmart CEO puts in place for the Walmart stores. Which so I there's mean, only so much you can do. I, I understand the push down, but then again it also becomes that in my eyes as well, especially like when any store GameStop's getting really bad about it because they're on their way out of business. Uh, I think we've seen it at Walmart a couple of times, like especially as cashiers where you're like, oh, you have to push these credit cards or you have to push this bullshit. Yeah. It's just like, I didn't get hired commission. Yes. Well, and that's why I made the, 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 distinction, the distinction between, between, between department the, stores. Exactly. Because when you're the store manager of like a department store, like the one I work at, okay, that makes more sense to me. Like, don't be wrong. There's still policy that fucks our store over in particular, just yeah. based off of the merchandise that Nordstrom is willing to give us. But, oh, I just said where I work. Oh, well, you know, fuck it. But, so I work for Nordstrom. But that the, because there are things that they're able to give us, right? <laughs> And uh, or yeah. things they they lack to give us because they give Scottsdale the the big store you know all the like shiny new toys basically right right but again the store manager's job is to make sure that you know 
visuals, make sure things are, you know, available for people, make sure that we're hiring people because there is the incentive of commission. Right. Finding people good salesmen. Yeah. And yeah, saleswomen yeah. to push the product as much yeah. as possible to drive sales. Right. But when you're getting into Walmart though, if you're not offered that incentive, you're you're really just looking for somebody who can push buttons on a cash register. Exactly. You know. So then you're telling these people that have no incentive to sell things and then you're basing their performance off of whether or not they sold these things. You basically have a vicious circle of like, well, you're just going to keep turning out cashiers because they don't want to do what you're telling them to do because you're not incentivizing them to do so. Yeah, exactly. So it's just... So that kind of becomes my point of like, well, then why are you doing it? Well, my experience, and it's like, of course, you know, I'm no manager. I haven't, you know, gotten to that level. I haven't Mm -hmm. gone to the executive side to see where it's coming from. But it feels like... That's kind of what executives do. They come up with these bright ideas and of how to improve efficiency or whatever, and then that just rolls downhill. Well, we have to improve efficiency, so I found this new thing, but I'm not going to implement it. You're going to implement it. Everybody that's below me has to implement it, and the way they implement it is by making their workers use it. Right. So it's like, I think you see a lot of that, that it's just like, oh, well, our numbers aren't great. Well... I'm the CFO or whatever, the financial officer. Maybe they do something else, you know, because they're probably more worried about the budget and everything of the entire company. But, you know, say they're the, you know, assistant, you know, vice president or something. Okay. And it's just like, okay, well, you know, well, your job's on the line. You need to come up with incentives on how to make more money for this company because otherwise we'll find somebody else to take your spot that can do that. Right. And also you have to prove relevance of why your position is needed. So I, I think once you get up there, it's not so much that you need to, that you're going to be replaced. Uh-huh. I think it's, you need to prove why your position is even needed in this company. Right. Because if they let you go, they'll probably just get rid of the position and continue business as normal. True. Well, that, and I guess that kind of goes to my point again of like yeah. why it's necessary. Exactly. I guess it's just, so you have, I guess it's just the title and money is saying like, oh, you worked your ass off, so you've proven And that I've seen that. You deserve I, this. I have worked for small companies. I've worked for companies that are less than 200 employees. Uh-huh. And yeah, I see people with inflated you know, uh, whoa, brain fart, uh, inflated titles. Right. That it's just like, well, why do you have that title? Why does your title exist? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because in a normal situation, your title wouldn't really exist. It's like, okay, I understand like a CTO, like a chief technical officer, they're overseeing, you know, the technology aspect of your business. Right. So why do you have chief executive overseeing technical displacement of the business officer? Right. And it's like, yeah, what yeah. the hell is that? Like, oh, I wanted a raise, but I also wanted a title that's specifically mine. Well, if you don't give this company a reason to keep that position open for you, uh-huh. they're going to can you and just dump that position because no business right. actually needs that position. Exactly. So usually I believe... Those are the ones that are coming up with these bright ideas of, oh, hey, we need to bring in this, you know, we need to start using FaceTime and use Facebook as part of our business or whatever. But, you know, we need to make sure it's profitable. So make sure everybody below us does it. And then everybody below you is like, why the hell are we doing this? Yeah. The first question is, so am I getting a 50 cent raise for For doing doing new stuff that wasn't part of my job description? But it's just like, no, it's because some higher up had to prove their prove the reason why their position existed. So they came up with some crazy ass idea. And now everybody has to suffer because of it. Right. So it's like, yeah, you end up with that. So it's just like, I hope I don't end up in that position. I do (laughs) want to climb the corporate ladder and get myself up to a decent position because it's like, of course, I want to make more money and I want to provide better for my family. Uh But it's like, I also hope I get put into a position that makes sense. That and matters has, and right. matters yeah. to the company and not some place that, in some position that's just like oh we see what you're capable of so we made up this position specifically for you so you better be the best version of you that has ever goddamn existed otherwise we'll just get rid of you exactly you know hold hold that thought or if you're finished with the thought think of another one because i have to pee now oh so entertain everyone for a little bit so for the first time 
Kyle gets domain over the Hardly Millennial podcast. Guys, I'm I'm not actually that evil though, so taking over this entire podcast probably wouldn't be the route I would go with. I mean, honestly, I'm just here to hang out with you guys and uh, give you give you a good time, ha- give you something to listen to. So, uh, hey, how's everybody doing out there? It's a uh, it's actually quite late for us here, but uh, you know. It, it, it's been pretty good um you know work's been good hopefully everybody out there is uh doing pretty well for themselves i hope uh all your ventures are going very well for you i hope you get exactly what you're looking for in life because you know what everybody deserves at least a little break you know you've worked hard you deserve that little extra bump in your pay you deserve that extra time for yourself you know what go out and achieve what your heart desires you know adam told me before i came over that if i needed to bring something i should bring whatever my heart desires that is a uh, that is a big that is a big vast vague thing to just tell somebody to do it's it's quite intimidating but if you know what you're after go for it just go for it. Am I right, Adam? Just fucking go for it, man. Right? Just fucking go for it. I think they got enough of my nonsense. I'm pretty sure they're glad you're back. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Absolute nonsense. <laughs> oh, man. Damn. It's so funny story. Uh, ready to finish up here on. So I have this thing right now where I have three separate computers Ooh. and each of them do three separate things i brought it up on the podcast before and i have an imac right so yes. i have two laptops two macbooks and i have a laptop mm-hmm. and or <laughs> fuck i've been drinking guys so i have two i may have two so <laughs> have fun with that last part of me being by myself so i have two macbook pros and an imac right so the imac i only use for photoshop okay that's its only purpose right i'm like in the process right now trying to clean it up to get everything onto one laptop right you know i feel like this branches perfectly from our last subject (laughs) (laughs) i mean why do you have three computers doing one computer's job well i'll explain it to you (laughs) so it's because of the software that exists on Mm -hmm. the different things right So, unfortunately, we don't live in a day and age now where you buy software on a CD and you you know install into your computer, then it's there forever. You have to pay now monthly subscriptions, right? For yes, for software. So, because of that, Photoshop, the free version that I currently have because I paid for it years ago, right, is on my iMac, and I only use it to make do Photoshop things for Hardly Millennial, specifically the title menus that you see on YouTube for all the Hardly Millennial podcasts. Those right? beautiful things? Those beautiful things. So that's all I use it for. So I can't do that on either one of my laptops right now. Yeah, that makes sense. So when I knew that I was coming to my parents' house to house it for them, mm-hmm. and I wasn't going to bring my iMac with me, to make a title for this, right. I was like, well, I'm just going to make a title. <laughs> That's a bullshit title. <laughs> Before I come, email it to me so I have it so that when it comes time to be able to upload it, I just have it there and uploading it. So I was trying to think of a fucking title that would be vague and just like not. Which beer is mine? They're both Kyle. yours. These are oh. mine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And so I was trying to think of a title that, I don't know, was just broad and didn't deal with anything. So so are you first, saying our episode that we're currently on has a title that has nothing to do specifically with what we're talking about tonight? Kind of, sort of. <laughs> 
So, so are we are at the end of the podcast. We're actually explaining why the title is what it is. Why the title is the way Beautiful. it is. Beautiful. I love it. So, first, I came up with, well, I came up with a lot of different random shit, you know, that just didn't make any sense. I was like, I'm not going to fucking do that because I'm not going to also mislead people. So, the first thing I came up with was like, well, why don't I just do the artsy fartsy shit and I call it Untitled right Uh. so but then my thought process was that's pretentious as fuck i'm not gonna do that yeah (laughs) so then (laughs) i named it untitled and pretentious that's the name Uh. of today's episode well i think that does fit we did have some pretension early in the episode i think i think like uh (laughs) i think when you brought up people's uh intelligence level to watch movies <laughs> <laughs> i had no other clue of how to fucking word that except if you're not fucking intelligent you can't get those fucking movies i'm sorry but <sighs> adam adam's a little pretentious but that's why we love him. i am a little pretentious but that's what i ended up naming so if anybody's like listening to like if you've made it to the end of this episode hey. And everybody, power to you, thank people you. People are sitting there going, "Why is this called Untitled and Pretentious?" The reason why is because I had to think of the title like almost a week before this podcast came I, out. I love that we didn't address it for over an hour. <laughs> you know what? I thought too when I titled it. Also, I was like, "You know how we can make this work? I'll just talk about why I titled it the way I titled it." That's beautiful. And by doing that, the title now makes sense. And it explains itself it's like a fucking paradox it's a title paradox and I, oh i should have called it title paradox nah. but then this conversation wouldn't have ever happened no i wouldn't have <laughs> All well right. i think that's that's a great place to end it untitled <laughs> and pretentious untitled and pretentious ladies and gentlemen how long did we go this time let's see let, let us see all right two hours Not we're bad. literally at two hours and one minute right now all right, guys. Well, good place to end it. I think that was beautiful. It was beautiful. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's podcast. Remember, Thank you. you can follow us on all the social media platforms. All of them. Did um, you know Hardly Millennial was on all the major social media did, platforms? Did you know? Did you know? Well, you know now. You know now. You know now. We also have a Patreon with just a plethora of donators. Oh, do we? On there. Oh, yeah. They give us money every single day. Did you know $5, there's there's $600. benefits to it? There's Those, benefits to that don't Patreon? Don't fucking lie to the people, Kyle. No, there is. Is they, there, Kyle? They get to hear a new podcast every week on YouTube. Every <laughs> <laughs> I promise everybody that there are, we don't, we, I know it's been a while since Matt and I have done an update video. I know all that people have been getting are the podcast, but I do promise there are things coming. (laughs) We're we're really about growth at Hardly Millennial, but we also have to realize when we're biting off more than we can chew. Yeah. And that's, you know, we had a whole podcast well, about that. Yeah, general, I know. You know. And it's just like the old Charmin commercials used to teach us. Less is more, man. Less is more, man. Less is more. So, again, the Patreon is www.hardly... Fuck. www.patreon.com forward slash hardly millennial. You can donate if you want to. We appreciate Adam, any donation. Let's wrap that back one more time. Okay. <gasps> Remember, we have a Patreon you can donate to at www.patreon.com forward slash Hardly Millennial. There we, it is. We appreciate any <laughs> donation we get. And any final thoughts, Kyle? Um, You know what? Be the best you you can possibly be. Or be the worst you. You know what? Follow your heart. Do what makes you happy. See, I knew it would come full full circle. You're all (laughs) welcome for that. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.